Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You may know by now that we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of James. These lessons are prepared for studying between October and December of 2014, and this is lesson number five in that series for November 1 of 2014. It's entitled, Love and the Law. We hope you've got your Bible handy. We're going to look at a lot of verses. You could guess that if you talk about love and law, there will be plenty of verses in the Bible to look at. But before we start, we would like to offer a word of prayer to ask the Holy Spirit to guide us as we talk. Our kind and wonderful Father, we've come this day to discuss your will, to understand you better, to understand your words and how the different aspects of the plan of salvation are supposed to fit together. Give us guidance, help us to say the right words, and may those who have an opportunity to listen or hear be helped is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Law and love. Is there any obvious relationship between those two words? Love is the fulfilling of the law, is it? Say that someplace? Yeah, Romans 13.10 says, and quoting Paul, and he, we consider him to be one of the experts on things like this, and I'm quoting, if you love someone, you will never do them wrong. To love, then, is to obey the whole law. One of the most incredible stories in the entire Bible is found in Luke 10, verses 30 to 37. It's a very famous story, and I'm sure if you have any biblical experience, you must have heard it maybe multiple times. And what actually happened, I'll just summarize the first couple of steps. A young man came up to Jesus. He was a lawyer, and he said to Jesus, um, what's the main requirement for salvation? And Jesus says, well, you need to keep the law. And he said, which laws? And... Um, Jesus said to him, much law, and he says, and he, you know, we would probably have said, quoted one or more of the, ten, of the Ten Commandments, but this young man said, no, love your neighbor, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he was right on top of it, and Jesus said, you're right. You do that, and, and you'll be just in great shape. But the teacher of the law wanted to justify himself, and now I'm going to quote. So he asked a very significant question to Jesus. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered, There was once a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when robbers attacked him, stripped him, and beat him up, leaving him half dead. It so happened that a priest was going down that road, but when he saw the man, he walked on by on the other side. I mean, after all, as a priest, you know, he could have easily gotten himself contaminated. Then he wouldn't be able to do his priestly responsibilities, right? Even blood would contaminate him, wouldn't it? Even blood. For two weeks or something like that? Something like that. In the same way, a Levite also came along, went over and looked at the man, and then walked by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was traveling that way came upon the man, and what nationality was the person who was beaten up? Samaria. The one who was beaten, beaten up. Yeah. Oh, the one that was beaten was up. Jew. He was a Jew, right. And... Who is this coming along now? Jew. The one who is coming along at this point is a Samaritan. What do we know about the Samaritans? They were pretty low on the pecking scale. You know. Where did they come from? They were a mixture of Galilee, ancient, yeah. of the northern tribes and people that came in. 700 years, 750 years more or less, well, more than that, maybe 600, 760 years before this story took place. Um, the Assyrians conquered the northern nation of Israel. They took most of the people out and scattered them through Assyria and all sorts of places. And then they imported people from all those different places into the northern country. And their idea was if you, if you scatter people around, there won't be enough of one group of people together at one point to mount a rebellion. That was basically the idea. And so what ended up there in Samaria was, or in the northern northern country, what used to be Israel, was <clears throat> a conglomerate of 
people worshiping all sorts of other gods, but they believed in those days that you had to worship the god that was for that place. And so they started to try to adapt in their pagan ways to worshiping the God of Israel. Because there were a few people from the God of Israel, well, few Jews still left there, who well, presumably could tell them how to worship God. Well, what you got was a, you know, a conglomeration of paganism mixed with um, Judaism and so forth. And they, when the Jews came back from Babylonian captivity, the Samaritans wanted to join them. They said, we'll, we'll join you. We'll, we'll uh, help you build a temple. And the, the Jews said, no, nothing doing. We don't have anything to do with you. And um, there was a rocky road from there on between the two. So that's the, that's the situation. So yeah. now? And significant theological differences. Yeah. So the Samaritan comes along the way. He went over to him, to the man who was wounded, poured oil and wine on his wounds, and bandaged them. And, and just as the Jews looked down on the Samaritans, the Samaritans looked down on the Jews. So what, we, what we're saying here is a Samaritan who his culture would tell him that this is in a, he shouldn't be touching the Jew, just like the Jew says you shouldn't be touching the Samaritan. Yeah. <coughs> so took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins. What are those silver coins worth? One silver coin is a man's wage for a day. So this is no small contribution he's making. And he said, give it to the innkeeper, take care of him, he told the innkeeper, and when I come back this way, I will pay you whatever else you spend on him. And Jesus concluded, in your opinion, <laughs> very clever. This, Jesus was so good at these kind of responses. In your opinion, he didn't say, well now who, you know, give the answer. He says, in your opinion, which one of these three acted like a neighbor towards the man attacked by the robbers? The teacher of the law replied, the one who was kind to him. Jesus replied, okay, you go and do the same. Simple, right? I mean, the thing is, if you have the person draw their own conclusions, then how can they argue with the answer? I mean, the conclusion was obvious, right? Yes. Nobody could argue with the conclusion. But if you give the answer, you can't argue with the answer, right? Well, Ellen White had some very interesting things to say about that parable, just to make it more real. Here's from Desire of Ages, page 498, paragraph 3. Among the Jews, this question, the question, who is my neighbor, caused endless dispute. They had no doubt as to the heathen and the Samaritans. These were strangers and enemies. But where should the distinction be made among the people of their own nation and among the different classes of society? Whom should the priest or the rabbi or the elder regard as neighbor? They argued about this all the time. So they were trying to draw Jesus into this argument that they were, they were go carrying on all the time. What else do we know about this story? On page 499, the next page, Ellen White says, this was no imaginary scene, but an actual occurrence which was known to be exactly as represented. The priest and the Levite who had passed by on the other side were in the company that listened to Christ's words. Mm -hmm. What do you suppose they would have said if Christ had turned to them and say, Who's your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? That's not all she says. On the next page she says, The angels of heaven look upon the distress of God's family upon the earth, and they are prepared to cooperate with men in relieving oppression and suffering. God in his providence had brought the priest and the Levite along the road where the wounded sufferer lay. So why were they, why were they on that road at that point in time? God brought them there. That they might see his need of mercy and help. That's uh... How often does that happen? 
How often does it happen? I mean, is that same providence brought me here with all of these people? Is that is is that is every interaction this this providential I, mingling on the I part of God? I think we're going to be amazed when we get to heaven. We're going to find out that God arranges all sorts of of contacts and meetings with people and so forth. I can mention some in my my own experience that are just amazing. Let me just tell you a very brief story. I was attending Johns Hopkins University back in Baltimore, Maryland, and my lab instructor said, I want to invite every, all you people in the lab to come over to my place on Saturday night and let's just get better acquainted. Well, you know, it's hard to say no to the teacher. He says, this will be, this will be a cocktail party. And I said, uh, I don't drink alcohol. Oh, he said, there's no problem. You can drink water. You can drink, that'll be soft drinks. You don't, just, just come, please come. So my wife and I drove down there uh, with a little trepidation, went up to the sixth floor where his apartment was, walked in, and he started introducing us to all the people who were there. That some of them had been my classmates. We just, I mean, only been there a couple months, so we were just getting to know people. And the last person he introduced me to was what well, last two people. One of them was my biostatistics teacher, and the other was a young lady that was with her, and I didn't recognize the young lady at all. But she turned to me and she said, as soon as, you know, I, you know the guy had finished and he was moving on to introduce somebody else, and she turned to me and she said, do you consider yourself to be a missionary? And I'm gulping, you know, where did that come from? And I said, well, it depends on what you mean by missionary. She says, don't give me that. She says, I want to know if you think you are missionary. And I had just come back from four years in working in Zambia. I said, well, yeah, I think so. OK, she says, now I have another question for you. If someone is seriously ill, in fact, if they're in a coma, and they're in a hospital 500 miles away, you can't go there. They obviously can't talk to you. You can't talk to them on the phone, nothing like this. If you pray for them, will it make a difference? And I said, that's not an easy question. She says, I know the answers to the easy questions. <laughs> she was, she was they, they, just, just like that, she was sharp as a cookie. And I said, well, I says, I can explain it to you if you have time. She says, we've got all night. So my wife and I started explaining to her about the great controversy and how God can do some things if we ask him to do them that he couldn't do otherwise. And um, I, I could tell you lots more interesting stories how it all developed, but she ended up being a professor at Lumberland University because I went to a cocktail party. <laughs> you never know, right? You know, I, I think it's... Um, now, this road that this incident occurred on, mm -hmm. that was, was that the road to Jericho? The main road between right. Jerusalem now, and Jericho. Now, in those okay. days, it was very steep. Right. Now, wasn't it widely known that this was a, the hangout of robbers and thieves. And yeah. so, um, I mean, why couldn't it be that the, the, the priest that went by, he saw the situation and thought, you know, this road has a reputation for these kinds of things. Right. He did. And That's exactly what he thought. And, and this could just be a ruse. And if I fiddle around here, you know, I'm going to be the one laying down And here. I'm the rich guy, and so they would love to catch That's me. right. And so the Levite comes along, et cetera, and so forth. So, you know, doesn't, I mean, is, isn't there some logic to, I mean, doesn't it make some sense that you know, they they kind of did the right thing if this is if this is actually the situation. So, I mean, Christian, if they've exposed themselves, they end up the same way. Their f families go hungry. They, okay. you know, and, and so on and so forth. They'll so if if some we see somebody in a terrible accident alongside the road, we shouldn't stop them, help them because we could be hit. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there's some logic to that. There's some logic to that, you know. Um, um, what if you even stop on the corner to give a guy a dollar bill who wants to buy a what, beer? What about what you about get somebody going around the corner? What about what about this? There are times when uh, people have had to flee for their ri lives in crowds of people, and there were people who tripped and fell and got stampeded. That's right, and you know you stop if you'd have stopped and picked up everyone, then you would have suffered the same consequence. So, 
So that's what these guys should have, you know, what It's called rationalization, <laughs> Jay. <laughs> well, not rationalization. It's a, it's a real, you know, it's a real, it's a real, it's a real situation that people face. You know, you, you jeopardize your families, your children go parentless. There's all kinds of things that could happen here in this kind of a, kind of a situation. So if in fact that is the case here, it is. What we're looking at is they well, didn't want to touch him because he was quotes unclean, not because. Well, I mean, that's, that's what that's we've mentioned so far, not because, well, you know, I might end up being in the same circumstance. I mean, why did the guy get in that condition? Somebody right there robbed him and beat him and, I mean, sure. And everybody who passed by, the, 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 the you know, the priest knew that, the, the Levite knew that, the Samaritan knew that. That when they, if they stopped there to help that guy, maybe, they were in potential danger. Maybe the Samaritan lucked out. <laughs> well, maybe the priest. <laughs> you know, maybe the priest would have lucked out too. What I find somewhat interesting here also is that uh, these two, the, or excuse me, the uh, priest and the Levite were there in the crowd when Jesus was telling yeah. the story, and most likely he was not looking directly at them. He probably d handled it somewhat the way he did with Simon, at Simon's house. Yeah. When he told the story <laughs> with. Uh, yeah. It, he'd got his. Or Mary. even when he wrote the things uh, with uh, the Mary, uh, Mary uh, the woman taking adultery, he just wrote it in the dust. And those who and Judas at the Last Supper. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that's the way he is. He's not a f boring on you. Yeah. you. They know what's going on in uh, yep. in, in their mind. And notice the, the lawyer. One more comment. A couple pages later, the lawyer would not even now, after the whole thing and realizing exactly what was going on would not even then take the name Samaritan upon his lips. He wouldn't even say the name. So he answered, the guy who had mercy on him. And Jesus simply just said, go and do the same. It's interesting that, uh, changing the subject slightly, this man came and said, what must I do to have eternal life? The rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what must I do to have eternal life? He said, keep the commandments, the same thing. And uh, then he said, what else do I need to do? Mm -hmm. The rich young man did, and go and sell everything. He just didn't tell this guy to do that. No. One other thing I, I just learned a couple few weeks ago. One can fake love. Mm -hmm. You can fake love too, yeah. okay? But you can't fake mercy. Mm -hmm. I just learned that about a couple of weeks ago. I thought, uh, thought that was interesting. Well, we are supposed to be studying the book of James. So in light of this story, let me read James 2, 1 to 4. My brothers and sisters, as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, you must never treat people in different ways according to their outward appearance, like if they're beaten up alongside the road. Suppose a rich man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes comes to your meeting, and a poor man in ragged clothes also comes. If you show more respect to the well-dressed man and say to him, have this best seat here, but say to the poor man, ah, stand over there or sit here at the, on the floor by my feet. Then you are guilty of creating distinctions. We today would call it what? Discrimination. Discrimination among yourselves and of making judgments based on evil motives. How about a general and a private? <laughs> you, come, you come to a drinking fountain and the general Everybody stands back and lets the general go first and get his drink. But the private, he has to wait. Well, there's a story about someone like that. He was on a train. And a lady, there was, it was mostly soldiers there. A lady came walking in, started down looking for a place to sit. And the one person who got up to let her have a seat was the general. And then all the other soldiers did what? Got up for the general, I bet. <laughs> they should have. <laughs> yeah, they were all looking very red-faced. Well, what do you think James was talking about? Do you think there could have been any kind of discrimination in his day? Of course. Of course. Of course. Well, it was, it was prevalent in, in every culture. 
Well, we know about some differences. We know about the differences between formerly Gentile Christians and formerly Jewish Christians. There was a great discussion about that in Acts 15. But wasn't there some? Wasn't there some? Some wasn't there? Some, aren't they acting upon the law here? Wasn't, weren't there some? When when the when the rules and policies and laws regarding the sanctuary and so forth were were given to the Jews, mm -hmm. weren't there pretty well some clear defined that certain people could, you know, that, that Gentiles were not supposed to be in the camp, you know, and supposed to be outside the camp, and so aren't we are we looking at almost God ordained? Uh, We'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm not quite ready for that yet. All right. Well, remember that at this point in time, we sometimes forget this, we often forget this. At this point in time when the Christian church is just getting started and people are joining by the thousands, the, church, the Christian church is technically illegal. It was forbidden by the Roman state. You could, you, if you belong to a national religion, Origin was already established. You know, it was the official religion of some territory or country. Okay, that's fine. But if you try to start a new religion, it was absolutely forbidden by the Roman government. So these people who are meeting as Christians, this is a clandestine operation. Okay? And look at these verses that give us a little picture of that. Look at Acts 18, verses 7 and 8. So he left them. Paul was chased out of the, the out of the synagogue in in uh, Corinth, so he left them and went to live in the house of a Gentile named Titus or I'm Titus, just as I don't know how to pronounce that name, who worshipped God. Worshipped God. His house was next to the synagogue. Now here's a former Pharisee living in the house of a Gentile. Does that say anything to you? Crispus, who was the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with all his family, and many other people in Corinth heard the message, believed, and were baptized. So, just to give you an idea how things were going. But even in that setting, some who were a little more wealthy than others, and perhaps offered their homes as a place in which to meet in certain cities, expected privileged treatment. Right? I mean, if it's your house, you expect to be treated a little different than someone who just walks in off the street. Well, Jesus had some things to say about that. Look at Mark 2, 16. Some teachers of the law, these are quoting Jesus, some teachers of the law who were with, I mean, talking about Jesus' behavior. Some teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw that Jesus was eating with those outcasts and tax collectors. So they asked his disciples, why does he eat with people like this? Does that reflect on our, the question of who's my neighbor? And then in Luke eleven forty three, how Jesus responds, how terrible, sorry here, push the wrong button. How terrible for you Pharisees, you love the reserved seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. How terrible for you, you are like unmarked graves which people walk on without knowing it. You know, we were talking last week about um, the disciples or the, um, the, well, whatever. They were going out to show that there were people that had the Holy Spirit. And we were kind of wondering, what would you see mm -hmm. to, um, to say that these people have the Holy Spirit? Well, if you go up to somebody and all of a sudden he gives nobody any preference that he used to mm -hmm. and he was actually actually friendly even to the low life mm -hmm. that would be something that you would see and say that this person's got the spirit now is it, so, is, it, is it really possible in our day for us to live above societal norms can we really treat all kinds of people equally well it's like somebody said you can fake it <laughs> That's not what I was asking. Well, sometimes, you know, it seems like the preacher's in the pulpit telling you to fake it. You know, we need to be doing this, we need to be doing that, we need to be doing this. And you can go out and do it, but does that mean that they have the Spirit? 
Yeah, they can fake it. Yeah. Some people, so, would, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Some people do it. Some people go to countries where they are killing people. People are all kind of diseases, but and they go and they jump in there and do all that sort of thing. But it depends on their motivation, and no one really knows unless you can really read inside the person. So it's hard to tell. But what I, if I, you what if you find somebody that you've seen last week motivated to jump in there and kill a bunch of people or whatever? Then all of a sudden. They've changed. He's got, they've changed. I mean, that would tell you that this person has a spirit. There are a lot of people who like to study the development of churches and, and why some churches grow and others don't and why people join the church and why they, they sometimes leave and so forth. And the Adventist church around the world has become very famous. We, be, we are especially good at bringing people in at the lowest levels educating them, giving them good health, etc. And often, unfortunately, when they get educated and doing well and so forth like this, they, what we sometimes say, they leave through the chimney. They, then they leave the church after they got all their education and so forth. Why do you suppose the Adventist church does that? I mean, why, why does it affect people like that? There's nothing motivates like greed. Well, no. it just tells why? you everybody's the same. I mean, people act differently because they're maybe in a lower strata of life. Mm -hmm. You bring them up, they just act like everybody else that are up there too. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe the same numbers of people who, who didn't become highly educated or prosperous or whatever are doing the same thing. Maybe, maybe we look at that and maybe, maybe that's our prejudice about the more highly educated people that is leading us to draw that that kind of a conclusion maybe it's a false conclusion maybe we're expecting more you know parents the, the researchers would have a hard time with what you just said well i don't pay too much attention to researchers anyway. <laughs> but <clears throat> no you're a teacher <laughs> i've learned um i distracted what i was going to say about that <laughs> sorry um well maybe it'll come back to me in a minute well so, James goes on. This is now the next couple of verses. Uh, all right, I, I, the thought came back. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, um, uh, we have Adventists, we have Baptists, we have Catholics, uh, and many of those people are very sincere in their faith, and they try and raise their children to be the same. But, you know, not all children uh, embrace the faith. Some, some leave. Uh, and we ask the question, some leave, some stay. Um, maybe the answer to that is, is the answer to the question that you asked. You know, people just make choices. And yeah. it doesn't make any difference uh, how, how hard we try as parents. Sometimes, you know, things just, the kids just make their own choices for reasons which don't seem to make any sense based upon you know, how, well, the opportunities they've had when they've grown up. So maybe we're ascribing to uh, these people that are, are raised in the church and they leave with, uh, I don't know, uh, um, more, more guilt than, than, or more, more guilt than, than we should. Well, James has listened, my dear brothers and sisters. God chose the poor people of this world to be rich in faith and to possess the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. But you dishonor the poor. Who are the ones who oppress you and drag you before the judges? The rich. I mean, pretty hard to argue with that, right? If I may answer the question you posed a minute yeah. ago. As uh, a person who was born in the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, I think Adventism, Adventists have a, has a lot of people that are Catholic Adventists, Buddhist Adventists. They become, if someone comes to your country and offer you something better, they take it. A lot of them don't even understand what Adventism I is. Mm -hmm. They think it's like, you know, Catholicism. But there is a difference. That's why a lot of time I say we should sometime mention that God loves you because that's what people, people from that level, then it's something you need. 
Mm -hmm. You know, but when you get to a certain education or what have you, you see things a little differently. So people who move from that to there, they're missing something. They get what they get and they go do something else. They want something a Jesus they can feel and touch. Mm -hmm. They don't want to hear that God only cares about his own character. Mm -hmm. I, I just heard so, or thought of something that I'd heard years ago. That was in India. These, uh, some people had worked for the denomination, but they were Hindu or whatever, what, I, whatever the religion they, were, they came out of. But they worked in uh, clear until retirement. Now they're no long, uh, now they're into retirement, no longer. But they're still getting their pay or their uh, retirement check from the denomination or however it worked over there. And they somebody popped in and they're still doing their little uh, Hindu things at home. So they never really break away. That that has a terrific hold on people's. Uh, you know, maybe it's just covering their bases. Uh. <laughs> well, maybe it's like uh, the ancients did. Uh, whichever god seemed to be the one that was. Uh, uh, winning, why that's the one we'll serve. Yeah, yeah. And if there's one that is good for fertility, well, we'll we'll make offerings to him. And if there's one that's good for uh, for crops or 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 what have you, uh, we'll serve him. Well, in Jesus' day, <coughs> these kind of distinctions were actually codified into laws. I'm going to quote one that was quoted in the IBP Bible Background Commentary: Persons of lower class who were thought to, to act from economic self-interest could not bring accusations against persons of higher class, and the laws prescribed harsher penalties for the lower class persons convicted of offenses than for offenders from the higher class. So it's assumed that you, you just assume that you have a wrong motive if you're, if you're a lower class person and you do something against an upper class person. If, um, if God's law had a, had a basic level is a, a law of love. Mm -hmm. um, how have we been so good at making it such a legal issue through the Ten Commandments, um, through, I mean, the Pharisees, but even today it's so prevalent that it's, especially if you're, quote unquote, a good Christian, they want to, you're a legalist or you're, um, yeah. where, how, if it's, if the law is love and you're following it, how can you get this um, title of of law? Legalism is usually the title you uh, apply to someone you, who's more strict in observing the law than you are. <laughs> One philosopher observing the behavior of people in this world suggested that the golden rule should read, he who has the gold makes the rules. That's probably more like the way it works here on planet Earth, right? Um, in our world today, Chrissy? Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who related a story to me recently. Um, their child had a child that potentially had a problem, serious problem, blindness. And they prayed. And they asked their friends to pray. And they asked their friends to pray. And it's a similar question to what the woman asked you. But they went to the doctor the next week and things were much improved. And the younger, the, the parents of this child said it's a miracle. The grandparents are going, I don't know, is it? Where, where are we in that process that, that the older we get, we look at things as maybe they're not... Skeptical. Yeah, mm -hmm. skeptical. Mm -hmm. Why can we not accept... We think we're too smart for that. Yeah. Okay, too does that go into that education once they get to mm -hmm. a certain point? Partly. Yeah. You got a definite answer there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, this is, this is real stuff. We're, we're talking real stuff. And, I mean, there's none of us at this table, I'm sure, would argue with the idea that Christianity is despised in the public media. It's looked down upon by people who are, quote, educated and sophisticated, and the people they quote, the smart, the smart people they quote on TV and radio and, and so forth. And if, you're, uh, if, you're, if you avoid some of the modern media and so forth like this, you're a legalist. Thank you, Johnny. <laughs> well, you know, my my wife used to say that um, 
Well, their their family's a first generation Seventh Day Adventist, and they they converted, and he she had five four brothers, and um, they would watch each other uh, to keep from breaking the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> so when Karen did something, I don't know what it was, but her brother said, "You broke the Sabbath. You broke the Sabbath." You know, like that. Um, I, I think that's that's the best definition of legalism I could I could come up with. That um, you know, you're just kind of looking for the outward appearances. In fact, if you look at the law to try to mimic it, that's a good way to fake things, isn't it? Yeah. So a legalist is kind of a faker. That's what I'd think. What, what, this title that we started with here, I should have asked this earlier. It's Love and the Law. What, what are we talking about here when we... The law has so many different... Um, yeah. In, in, in Jesus' day, there were several main definitions of law. What, what is this law right here? What's that law that we're talking about? Well, again... Is this the it, Ten it, Commandments or is this... You know, the Ten Commandments are only a, a, a very condensed version of the whole concept of what law is or and to a, the way God operates. This is the rules of his universe. Is that what we're talking about here? And Okay, well, let, let, me, let me give you a little bit of an answer. I don't have time if we're going to finish the rest of this lesson to go to in, in depth. But the truth is, we're, we're, we don't like to think about this, but the truth is that what we worship, every one of us, is our idea of God. Each one of us has a different version of God. And that's what we worship. And hopefully it's clo it gets, over time, it gets closer and closer to the real God, more and more accurate. But th that idea also applies to the law. Every one of us here has a little bit different idea of what law is. And I can't set up criteria for all of you. It could be the Ten Commandments to the, mo to the ancient Jews, when you said law, it would have been Torah, and Torah meant the five books of Moses, so you can call it that if you want. Sometimes the law referred to the entire Old Testament, so take your pick. I tell you, you ask what a Seventh Day you ask the Seventh Day Adventist what the law is, they'll tell you what it is. <laughs> it's yeah. the Ten Commandments. They don't even think about that other stuff, and yet, when it all came to being originally, the law meant everything. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take another couple of verses. Look at James 2, 8, and 9. We need to keep moving here. You will be doing the right thing if you obey the law of the kingdom, which is found in Scripture, love your neighbor as you love yourself. But if you treat people according to their outward appearance, you are guilty of sin, and the law condemns you as a lawbreaker. Therefore, do I conclude fairly that discrimination is a sin? Is that the opposite of is discrimination the opposite of love? Discrimination. It's important. To, love. It's important to be discriminating. To use good discrimination. <laughs> that uh, James two eight is a parallel to Romans two fourteen and fifteen. When those who have never heard of the law show, uh, of a law show that the what the law requires is written on their heart. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for me to, to respond appropriately to the law if I cannot discriminate between good and, and bad. Well, and God certainly discriminates between good and bad. He just doesn't discriminate between good people and bad people. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> in the end, I suppose you would say he does, but he, he you know, he, we've all heard this statement. He loves the the sinner and he hates the sin and we tend to love the sin and hate the sinner. <laughs> but I don't know what they're, I mean isn't the Bible and the Psalms full of passages that said, say that God takes care of, of the righteous and those that aren't so righteous he, he doesn't take such good care of. There's verses in Job that say the other way around. Mm-hmm. No. Well, look what happened to Job. Right. And Job was He's not always saying that. But even Jesus, I, I adore <laughs> Jesus. Even Jesus made, made a distinction 
Uh, you know what I'm saying? Supposedly say things like slave, do this for your master, this, this. He, he put things, you know, he categorized things in a, in a way. If we are to believe everything in the Bible, we have to question a lot of things. I just choose to love Jesus and God <laughs> and know that I don't understand it all. Let's be very clear. There were very distinct parties in Jesus' day. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were at each other. The patriot, the, what we sometimes call the patriots, or the, the, you know, the really the rabid rebels against it, would hated the Roman government. The tax collectors apparently liked the Roman government. They did very well by the government. The Qumran community down there by the Dead Sea were taught to, quote, hate the children of darkness and the men of perdition. They're probably talking about the leaders of the temple back in Jerusalem. Hmm. So, Jesus himself was certainly the greatest example of love for one's neighbors that ever could be given. He even died for his enemies. And I quote from Ellen White, Sin is the greatest of all evils. I guess that's pretty obvious. And is ours to pity and help the sinner. There are many who err and who feel their shame and their folly. They are hungry for words of encouragement. They look upon their mistakes and errors until they are driven almost to desperation. These souls we are not <coughs> to neglect. If we are Christians, we shall not pass by on the other side, keeping as far as possible from the very ones who most need our help. When we see human beings in distress, whether through affliction or through sin, we shall never say, this does not concern me. Desire of Ages, page 504. That's immediately following the story, of course, of the Good Samaritan. So would we, should we deliberately go down the Jericho Road looking for people like that? You think Jesus did that? <clears throat> did he go as way out of his way to help a lady whose daughter was possessed with a demon? Well, that'll keep a fella pretty busy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course, he was kind of asked to go. Yeah. Me. Well, he, and you're, he, you're suggesting that maybe we ought to just not be asked, just go do it. I mean, if I did that all the time, I'd never take a vacation. <laughs> you know, I should, should I not maybe go up and see my grandchildren, or should I spend all my time over in you're, the you're, prison, or at... at, at your grandchildren need you too. <laughs> well, yeah, but they're not quite as bad off. They've got other Samaritans to take care of them. <laughs> Choose. So, you know, how do you balance that? Well, James became pretty blunt about this. Providence. Look at James, look at the next two verses. Whoever breaks one commandment is guilty of breaking them all. For the same one who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Even if you do not commit adultery, you have become a lawbreaker if you commit murder. Okay? What do we learn from that? Well, first of all, why is that? Well, I mean... How can you break them all if you break one? Very easy. You, <laughs> no, explain yeah, it to me. I, well, I, I if, if you loved either your wife or the person that you murdered or whatever, it doesn't matter. If you have the love for another person and you break that by doing something bad to them, you have broken the law. Okay, so everything is an act of love. You break one of them, you're breaking the love. If you break a, one of the laws of the U.S. government and you get arraigned in court, are you taken to court as a lawbreaker? Yeah, but yes. you're, not, you're not thrown in jail because of Sure, you are. Of all the other ones that you broke, because of the, you broke that one, you're thrown in but, jail but because of that law that you broke. It's, yeah, it doesn't say you become a lawbreaker of all the others. It says you become a lawbreaker. But you are says, a lawbreaker. But this one says that you break one, you break them all. Well, in a, yeah. sense, in a sense, you do that civilly as well. When you break a law, you're this may be the one law that you have broken, but you have separated yourself from the consent and, and uh, that we have all agreed to govern ourselves by. There is a spirit of which this particular law is only a part. 
and um, yeah, we need to we we need to come to the conclusion here because our time is running out. Think about the Jews in Jesus' day, because those are the ones that Paul was writing to. Those are the ones that James was writing to. They had figured out. I don't know how they did this. They had figured out that in the five books of Moses, there were 613 different laws. 248 of them were considered to be positive, and 365 were considered to be negative. Okay. Jesus comes along and he says, you only have to do one thing to keep the law. Love your neighbor. Love God. Think, think what a radical idea that was. I mean, the people said, you mean I don't have to do this? All these rules that are here? And Jesus says, love, your God, love God and love your neighbor. And it makes sense. It does. I mean, if sense. you stop and think about it, of course it makes sense. It makes sense. Well, it's, it is because aren't you fulfilling all those laws? Mm -hmm. So you're not, so when the person says, you mean I don't have to do did, 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 that? That Jesus should have said, "No, no, I didn't say that. I said love them." Mm -hmm. So you are keeping those things by loving your neighbor. So is 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 loving a kind of obligation? Um, you have to do this, right? You can't love by ob obligation. That's just like some girl coming up to anybody and say, "Hey, you gotta love me," and then marry me. And then, then demanding it, and then um, I mean, what? What's <laughs> well, going to happen if that, that happens? I don't know. Paul, <laughs> Paul said, "Go love your wives." Yeah. So how do you? You're married you go, to them. You must have had some love in the first place. How do you? Life. How do you go make yourself love somebody? Well, you should be able to do your <laughs> wife, right? Okay. Ellen White has. <laughs> Ellen White has some very very potent words to say about people who do things because they think they have to. I'm quoting now, the man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely, he thinks he has to, you know, because he's required to do so, she says, will never enter into the joy of obedience. In fact, he does not obey even though he's doing his level best to keep the commandments. When the requirements of God are accounted a burden, in other words, he thinks, I've got to do this. When they're accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. Wow. How many people on Sabbath mornings <laughs> are attending Seventh-day Adventist churches because they think they're supposed to? Especially in Loma Linda. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I've spoken with people who tell me it's they're close. Oh, really? We are. Oh, also? It's everywhere. They close their business, and I say, why do you close on Saturday? He said, because I live in Loma Linda. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, <laughs> let, let me it read on. It good. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. People who operate out of principle. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all righteousness, now we ought to all understand what is the essence of all righteousness, right? Is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right. How many of the things, how often do we do something because it's the right thing to do, whether we want to or not, whether, you know, in other words, in general, people think, why do you do that? We say, because it's the right thing to do. Because right doing is pleasing to God, she adds. Christ Object Lessons, page 97 and 98. And then here's another one that's even rarer that very few people have seen. Here's the sort of the second half of that. A sullen submission. If you're doing something because you think you have to, would that be a sullen submission? Mm -hmm. A sullen submission to the will of the Father. I'm doing it, God. Don't leave me. Just, just be thankful I'm doing it will develop the character of a rebel. Will, not maybe sometimes, perhaps, will develop the character of a rebel. By such a one's service is looked upon as drudgery. It is not rendered cheerfully and in the love of God. It is a mere mechanical performance. Gary, faking it, okay? 
Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay you're with me, right? <laughs> if he dared, such a one would disobey. His rebellion is smothered, ready to break out at any time in bitter murmurings and complaints. Such service brings no peace or quietude to the soul. This was originally found in Signs of the Times, July 22, 1897, paragraph 11, if you care to look it up. I think it's more clear if she would have said, if you are forced to do it. Well, because people, people when, you say obli to do it. when you say you're obligated, well, come on. It says in the Bible that the wages of sin is death. <laughs> you better, you better do something about it, or you're going to die. That's so, kind of an obligation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So if well, that's if that is in fact my mm -hmm. circumstance, I'm doing the law because uh, whatever. How do I get myself to where I can love to do the law? How okay. can I how can I make that transition? How can I? The the only the only way that I know of is to study the life of Jesus, and try to understand why he did what he did. And see if you can th come to understand the principles involved in his life. And then if you can say, well, do I want to be that kind of a person? Do I want to live that kind of a life? Then I'm going to follow those principles. And I don't know any other way to do that. That's why we're talking about that really here, because James says faith, that is a, a correct relationship to Jesus Christ, or to the Father too for that matter, and the Holy Spirit, a right relationship to them will lead to this kind of behavior. And that's why we're saying love is related to law. If you look at the words, a lot of verses in the Bible that talk about judgment, two of them are found in, well, let's just read the ones from James here, James 2, 12 and 13. Uh, Speak and act as people who be judged by the law that sets us free. What? I, th I thought laws would, were things that keep people from being free. What kind of a law sets people free? A law of love. <laughs> yeah, well, the law of love. But you can spread it a little bit more than that. In other words, if when we get to heaven, there are going to be no police, there's going to be no jails, there's going to be no one limiting anyone's ability to do whatever they want to. So the only safety in heaven is going to be what? Nobody will even want to do what is wrong. Nobody will even want to do what's wrong. So if no one even wants to do what's wrong, what happens? You have a perfectly free society. Everyone can do whatever they want to do. So what the principle behind this then is, if we can learn why God asks us to do things, if we understand why God asks us, we understand the principle involved, and then we say, yes, I want to live according to these principles that are the foundation of God's government, what happens? What if you don't want to live the principles of the Then God will have to say to you, sorry, so you, don't, you don't belong here. maybe we're not as free looking at it that way <laughs> as we say. I don't know that's exactly there. what Satan said. That is exactly what Satan said, and that's why he's I no know, longer in heaven. I know. He did say that. But what's the answer to that? That's what I'm saying, asking, because... Well, because I just said here that um, if you decide not to go that way, you're not, you're, you're, um, you end you're up just doing, doing what, what you, your, fr your freedom's telling you to do. And you end up with Satan on his side, and, and, and you'll end up, if God turned Satan loose and let him allow, let him, allow to, him to do whatever he wanted to do, he would destroy himself and everyone else around him. That's what selfishness does. It is self-destructive. So God is what? Sin pays its wage. Yeah. God is saying the only way that you can have a large group of people living together in total and complete freedom and happiness is to have people who everyone says, I'm not going to do anything wrong to you because I love you. I'm not going to do anything wrong to you because I don't even want to. That is the only way. That's why Satan had to be thrown out of heaven. Those two worlds just aren't compatible. So, Ellen White goes on to say, God has acknowledged you before men and angels as his child. We have verses like that. Pray that you may do no dishonor to the worthy name by which you are called. We are called Christians. 
Now, you know, at the beginning, Christians was a bad name. Mm -hmm. People were called Christians as, as they were trying, people were trying to make fun of them and say, there's those crazy people who are following a dead man. That was the idea. But we have turned it, fortunately, into a glorious name. God sends you into the world as his representative. Each one of us is supposed to be God's ambassador. How do we represent God as his ambassadors? This you can do only through acceptance of the grace and righteousness of Christ. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 107, paragraph 1. Whether we like it or not, Christians are judged by their behaviors. We're judged by our behaviors. Mahatma Gandhi had some interesting things to say about Christians. On one occasion when, and remember he was the famous uh, Hindu, on one occasion when talking to Christian, he's reported to have said, then we were surprised, the, the, the Christian says, then we were surprised when he, Gandhi, said, I have a great respect for Christianity. I often read the Sermon on the Mount and have gained much from it. I know of no one who has done more for humanity than Jesus. In fact, there's nothing wrong with Christianity. But the trouble is with you Christians. You do not begin to live up to your own teachings. Do we... Why is that? How do that? we respond to that? Why is that? Oh, never mind. Is it true? Let me just ask the question. Is it true? What was the question again? We're still here. <laughs> <laughs> is it true that we Christians have failed to live up to Christian ideals? If we lived up to Christian ideals, we wouldn't be here, would we? We well, would be in heaven by now. The other question is, is that our problem or is that God's problem? It's our problem. It's our problem. Okay. Well, I mean, God has provided the means, all the help. We, God will provide every kind of help you can possibly imagine if you just take advantage of it. So I, I, under those circumstances, I have to say, the problem is we haven't taken advantage of it. Well, I'm not sure, so sure that Gandhi lived up to everything. Well, uh, Gandhi is not our or standard, that, remember. Or that, or that, yeah. Well, anyway, we're, time's about out here. We're running out of time here. There are some great stories, and if you want to <clears throat> grab our, our, our handout, you'll get some more stories about people who did very dangerous but loving things and would be great examples. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for being with us through this, this program, for helping us to discuss things in, in a good way and to come to some proper conclusions. May our message be caught and understood by the people who listen to our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.